So last week we considered the divine ideal for all of our relationships. As the Apostle Peter summed it up, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. He had already suggested that we ought to submit to one another out of a gentle and quiet spirit. And so we're to respect all people, respect all people as being made in the image of God which is only ever truly possible if we are in a right relationship with the Heavenly Father, where we're totally honest before him, where we're allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, seeking that he will cleanse us from all guilt, shame and fear. And as we read Genesis chapter 2, that was how it was for Adam and Eve as they walked with God before their fall. They walked without any shame, guilt or fear. They were both naked, they felt no shame. And we've tried to imagine the beauty of that original creation. We've tried to imagine the wonder of their relationship with God. And we try to envisage envisage their relationship with one another before the fall. It's so hard for us to to try and get our our head around, to try and envisage their relationship before the fall. They, They took delight in one another. They complimented one another. They helped one another. Can you imagine a relationship where they weren't frustrated or angry or disappointed in the other at all? where they helped one another. In their sinless environment, they were without shame, guilt or fear. They were completely vulnerable before each other in the beauty of untainted innocence. God makes the point in his word that they were naked and unashamed. Untainted innocence. Their environment was perfect. Their relationship with one another was bliss. Pure delight was their relationship with one another. This was heaven on earth. And so it is. It's hard for us to to imagine. And yet in that perfect environment, Adam and Eve rebelled. And they turned paradise into a wilderness. They had the perfect environment to live in. They had the perfect environment, the, the perfect circumstances. They had everything that they could have possibly desired. And yet it seems they desired more. And so living in the perfect world is not the, envi- is not the answer. Although many people today are trying to conjure up their ideal living circumstances. Some people are trying to create the ideal living circumstances and think, well, that'll fix it all. But humanity's troubles are not from our circumstances that we find ourselves in. Rather, our problem comes from within, comes from the sin that lies within comes from fear and guilt and shame. You see, for most of us, we still long for more. doesn't matter how much we have and, and how good it may all be, we still seem to want more. As human beings, it appears that we always want more. We're not satisfied. We're, somehow or other, we're not content If only we had a little bit more money and so we we gamble or we go in for the lottery. Could this be evidence that we're not fully resting in the Lord? Could this be evidence that our relationship with God doesn't fully satisfy us? Could this be evidence that we're listening to the lies of the evil one? And so we come to Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, 
Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? There are a number of wild animals that God had created that Adam and Eve could not treat as domesticated. And for whatever reason, Satan decided to speak through a serpent. We read in the book of Revelation, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Elsewhere, we're told that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so he came up to Eve in a form that was not foreign to her. She had seen serpents. Satan and his demons often come to us masked, somewhat hidden within the familiar hidden within that which is not foreign to us. Could be TV, movies, internet, social media. Sometimes he even speaks through a workmate or a friend, a neighbour, feeds our dissatisfaction with thoughts of ways that might seek to uh, try and alleviate that. Remember how Jesus speaks to Simon Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. The things that you have in mind are not the things of God. And he's the master in deception. Knowing that Eve, knowing that she, knowing that this woman had not heard from God directly, hadn't heard God's instructions directly from him but through Adam, he twists the truth just a little bit initially to cause some doubt in her mind. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Oh, hang on there, what did God say? Seeds of doubt. And if, if this throws just a little bit of doubt, then the next statement creates even greater doubt that she may not or should not necessarily trust God. Now, we're made in the image of God, and we've been thinking about that. We, we have the capacity to think, to feel, to evaluate, to create, to love, to make our own choices. The serpent doesn't question the goodness of God. He cannot question the goodness of God. But he causes the woman to question her freedom. And she thinks about, as she thinks about these questions, evaluating what's been said, what's been put before her, how she feels about that, she has a choice. Do I listen to God or do I listen to the serpent? Which one do I trust more at the moment? When it comes to sin, for us, we face the same dilemma. Do I listen to God or do I listen to Satan? Which one do I trust the most at the moment? And most times we go, I want to trust God the most. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve stated that they were free to eat from any tree in the garden but one. Any tree but one. One, and ultimately this was the one area that Satan attacked. And he was questioning, how free are you? Don't you want to be free like God? This was the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It contained an understanding or an experience of what would be good and what would be evil. And... Adam and Eve 
didn't have a clue, didn't have any idea what evil looked like. They didn't know what evil looked like. They lived in an environment that was very, very, very good. This is good. But we're not really free because we don't know what evil looks like. We haven't tasted evil. What does evil look like? What's God keeping from us? The seeds of doubt. And don't we all want freedom? We all want true freedom? To have no restrictions placed upon us whatsoever? Don't we all want that? That's why so many of us struggled when COVID first hit. We didn't want any government telling us what to do or telling us what we couldn't do. We wanted freedom. And for most non-Christians, think about the non-Christian world, they don't want to read and obey the rule book. They want freedom. They see Christianity as restrictive, overbearing, as, as limiting their freedoms. There's something within us that longs for freedom. However, we determine that that looks something within us that longs for freedom, to be able to make our own choices when we want and do whatever we want when we want. And with this freedom, we want to be in control. And so Satan is feeding into this longing for freedom and control. He's sowing the seeds of doubt into her mind. God's holding something back from you. You don't, you don't want to let something go by that you could have an opportunity to know about. You're not truly free. You do want to be like him, don't you? You do want to know the difference between good and evil, don't you? And so she's tempted and she begins to justify her desires. If, if God declared that everything is very, 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 very good, then so is this fruit. Surely he wouldn't want to deny us something that is good. Justification takes place. And for many of us, we soon find ways to justify what we know is not God's good and perfect plan for us. We find ways to justify it. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, it was pleasing to the eye, it was also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And then the eyes, sorry, she, she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, they realised they were naked and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Notice that for Eve, it was, it was just a piece of fruit. It was just a small piece of fruit that Satan used. It was insignificant, really, piece of fruit, wasn't it? He does the very same thing with you and I. It's just something insignificant. It's just something small, some habit, some possession, some secret sin, some bitter resentment. And in the, the scheme of my whole life, it's just a small thing. He does the same thing within us. It's the one area that Satan is testing our trust in God. And most times Satan comes back to you time and time and time and time again in that very one same area, doesn't he? And for most of us, we soon find ways to justify what we know is not God's good and perfect plan for us. We find ways to justify it. And like Eve, we often take time to turn the fruit over in our hands. Just ponder for a while. Turn it over in our hands, smell it, stare at it, sit it on the mantelpiece and look at it for a while before we take a bite. The longer we ponder Satan's question, the more reasonable it becomes. 
Notice too that their freedom, their true freedom to remain within the wonders of paradise, the glorious garden, and within the beauty of their relationship with God and with one another, that was their true freedom. Eve seemed to forget in her conversation with the serpent that God was, God was really saying, you are free. You are free, free to eat anything and everything else, but that one. Everything and anything else, you can eat it. Go for it. Free to rest in the life-sustaining peace. God was saying, rest in the life-sustaining peace without fear because I am God and you don't have to be. You are truly free. You and I are also free to rest in the loving and life-sustaining peace that God offers to us. We're free to rest in that life-sustaining peace. For Adam and Eve, however, they had their cake and they wanted to eat it too. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to set the rules and the agenda and so they ate their cake and then they realised that the boundary lines of freedom shifted. They were now free to live outside of God's full blessing. Yes, they would still know good. They would still know good. They would still know the goodness of God and his presence but they would also know evil. And they would live in a world that God had created for them that was good, but live now within a sin-filled world. The boundary lines of freedom had shifted. If there's one thing that we learn as parents, it's that our kids need boundaries. And once they know the boundaries, they tend to operate best within those boundaries. Where the boundaries are not that well defined, where boundaries are somewhat confused, they push against and through those boundaries far more frequently than we'd like because sometimes there may be consequences and other times there aren't. And so the boundary lines are somewhat confused. And kids soon know when the boundary lines lie or are different between, say, their parents and their grandparents. And they'll quickly adjust to function within those boundaries. And so the boundary lines of freedom are just shifted for Adam and Eve, and now they have to learn to live within those boundaries. God would not remove himself from them, but now they would have to call out to him. They would have to call out to God. When Jesus was facing the, the most traumatic time of his earthly life, he went into the garden to seek the Father. And there he was strengthened for what lay ahead. We too call upon God and we meet with him and we find comfort and guidance, strength and wisdom when we call upon God. And God will never be hiding from us. Come to the garden and you won't find God hiding. But as Adam and Eve had previously only known what was very, very good and having been created in the image of God, that image was now fractured, confused, disoriented, distorted. Purity and innocence was now replaced or displaced with shame and guilt and fear. They realised they were naked and so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. Verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? 
Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Adam and Eve now know shame, guilt, and fear. They were ashamed of their nakedness, and so they tried to hide, hide themselves. They tried to cover themselves, rather. They disobeyed God, and in their guilt, they sought to hide from him, and they were afraid, having never been afraid of anything before. They were now afraid. Guilt, shame, and fear had now distorted their relationships with God and with one another. And immediately, neither is willing to take responsibility, but rather point the blame somewhere else. Neither is prepared to go back to where they were in the beginning. And you might recall, in the beginning, their relationship was one where they delighted in one another, complimented one another, helped one another, were not frustrated or angry or disappointed in any shape or form with the other completely vulnerable before each other. Now, they're not going to back one another up. And you know the rest of the story, how it unfolds. Eve blames Adam, Adam blames the serpent, and the serpent doesn't have a leg to stand on. (laughs) But in terms of defence, he doesn't have a leg to stand on. Adam doesn't just blame the serpent, though, does he? He also blames God. The woman you gave me, the wo- you, he blames God too. And so it is that we might want to do just as they did, point the finger directly at Satan. However... You and I are responsible for our own sin. You and I are responsible for listening to the doubts. You and I are responsible for seeking to justify our own decisions. You and I are responsible for failing to trust in God. We're responsible for our own sin. We must stop pointing the finger of somewhere else, blaming somebody else who hurt me, blaming our parents, blaming whoever. We're responsible for our own sin. Regardless of whom we might want to blame, there is no getting away from the fact that we're responsible for the way that we respond to God's word. We know, too, God's response to their sin and the rebellion. But rather than focus on the negative, as much as we might want to focus on the negative outcomes of sin, what we do see is the gracious heart of our Father God. He doesn't remove himself from a sin-filled world. In the Garden of Eden stood the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Beside it stood the tree of life. God continues to stand with us, stand with you through the tree of life in the form of the cross. He still stands with us today. And he invites us to come under the power of the cross. It's forgiveness, his forgiveness and eternal life. Sin, sin traps us in shame, guilt and fear. And we're often held captive by them until we accept forgiveness. God's still calling today as he called out to Adam, where are you? Where are you? Are you held captive by sin at the moment? God longs for you to know his forgiveness and freedom from guilt and shame. Why don't you accept his forgiveness? And start with a clean slate. Again, another clean slate. 
Accept that Jesus' death on the cross has paid the price for your sin. Do you need to fall before him as your Lord and your Saviour? Now, I invite you to do that this morning because God has done everything. He's done everything to restore you to himself. Praise God. We're going to stand and sing our closing song.